I am so excited to be podcast interviewing you. Not only am I a big fan of your uh, implants and periodontal and high tech, but it's so amazing to be interviewing uh, a dentist all the way from Romania. You're from um, Arad, Romania, Romania, correct? Yes. And how do you pronounce your name? I'm not even going to try because I'm so bad at languages. How do you pronounce your name? My name, Kafadaru Mihna. Mihna Kafadaru. Mishna Kafadaro. Something like that. It's okay. Oh, yeah. I know. I, I, the only, I have to admit to everyone, and I've told everyone, the only D I ever made in my entire life was in Spanish. And my teacher's name was San Martin, and he told my mother I was linguistically retarded. That's, that was his words in high school. And then the happiest day of my life was not when any of my four boys were born. It was when my mother told me I no longer had to take piano lessons. And my piano teacher told my mom that I couldn't carry a tune in a lunchbox. And speaking of tunes, when I think of Romania, I'm sorry, I'm sure there's a lot of great reasons to think of your country, but I always think of the greatest Michael Jackson concert that was ever done, uh, which was in Bucharest, Romania. Not to be confused with Budapest, Hungary, but that concert, I mean, that that's the only – in fact, my go-to when I'm on television or I'm on uh, – at home, and I just want to um, listen to Michael Jackson. I always throw the live in Bucharest, Romania uh, concert on. That 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 was that was that was his magnum opus. That that was just the greatest. Uh, I heard but, that that was great. That I heard that was great. You heard that was great. Yeah, I I think it was his, his cat's meow, his bee's knees. I think that was the best work he ever did. So thank you so much for. Uh, it's uh, ten o'clock in the morning here, and it's eight o'clock p.m. there. So you're ten hours ahead, for, which means you're probably. 10, 12,000 miles away. I love this internet. I love uh, podcasts. You know, here's some dentist anywhere around the world. They might be driving to work, driving home from work. They might be uh, who knows. And uh, this is outstanding. So tell me, the first thing I want to ask first for the viewers around the world, tell us about um, what is it like dentistry in Romania? Do they have um, water fluoridation? Um, is there... From what you see, is there more decay now than there was 20 years ago because they're eating and drinking more sugar? Or what, what, is, what is it like being a dentist in Romania that you think other dentists from around the world might not know about practicing dentistry in Romania versus their country of, say, Canada or Australia or America or England? Or... I, I don't know how, how dentistry is in America because I never, I never practice it there or in Canada or – uh, in Europe, it's a bit different because the rules are a bit different. Uh, we get to try different materials that uh, in America are not available because of the FDA, probably. Um, we get to try uh, uh, different uh, methods um, than in America, than um, Americans are used to try because uh, we are allowed to. For example, the, the PRF, the, um, the PRF uh, clot from blood, I've heard that uh, in some states in America it's not uh, allowed. They are not allowed to use it, but I'm not sure if I'm, I'm right with this, uh, with this uh, information. Um, in general, we do the same stuff. We do implants, we do uh, fillings, we do root uh, planning, uh, we do canals, we do all stuff that in America uh, we are doing. And how many people live in Romania and how many dentists are there? I don't know exactly. You don't know exactly? No, no, no. I, I don't know. But uh, in the capital only are 2 million inhabitants, so maybe they have one, 100,000, I don't know, 1,000, 10,000 uh, dentists I'm I'm not sure. I don't know. Okay, Ro yeah. Romania has two million people. You said no, Bucharest only. So oh, Bucharest only has two million. If we think about uh, the entire Romania, I can Google it. But uh, there's a lot of dentists because uh, we have, uh, I think, ten schools, dentistry schools, eight or ten dentistry schools, which uh, bring uh, a lot of dentists every year. So there's a lot of work. But uh, and and when you graduated from your dental school in um, Romania, you then went all over Europe, um, 
training under implantologists, uh, many great implantologists. How, 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 did, how did that happen in your journey? What, what made you go around Europe? And um, you'll have to pronounce some of these names. Anaki Gambarina, Maria Stigman, Anton Skulian, Mauro yes, so, Fradanini. Yes, um, I met a guy, a dentist, uh, when I graduated that gave me the push, the big push. And I was working uh, with him at that time in 2007. Um, I worked with him until 2011, I think. And in this period of time, uh, when he was going to an event, I was going with him. And when he was going to a course, I was going with him in Germany, in um, in Europe in general, or in Romania. And uh, he gave me this um, taste of dentistry. I was uh, looking only implants, implants, I have to see implants, I have to do implants. And he told me, if you want to make a great implant, you have to do a perfect fitting, dental fitting first. So he tried to um, make me look at uh, dentistry, at his um, whole um, benefits, not only what I was thinking I like, I, I uh, used to like. I'm not. Uh, my English is not really great. I hope. Uh, I hope you understand me. Um, I I think your English is outstanding, and I don't know a single word of another language. And uh, so, I, I my hat is so off to anybody who can carry you know, on a dental conversation in another language. I that blows my mind. So this this guy this guy uh, told me that if I if a patient come to my office, um, he will ask. First of all, he will ask to take away his pain or to do a dental filling or to do a root canal, maybe. Um, And only after that, after I will gain his trust, he will maybe let me put an implant in his mouth. So from that uh, moment, I was trying to, I was started to to look at dentistry uh, at a different uh, level. And I was uh, going with him everywhere, everywhere uh, he was going. So this, was he a classmate or was, or was this no, the first? He was, he was 10 years bigger than me. He was my boss at that time, my, my employee. And um, he gave me all the credit to make a great uh, dentistry at his clinic. He had a great, he, he owns a great clinic in uh, Timisoara, next to our city. And um, he told me that I can be a great dentist if I want to. But I have to be a dentist, not an implantologist. That is, uh, that is so amazing that you have a mentor like that. And it's so, uh, um, a big piece of advice to the listeners is uh, all dentists, by and large, are shy, introvert. They remind me more of physics majors, math teachers, professors. And so many times, I can't count. I mean, over a hundred times, I've gone into a dental building where they have like six or seven offices. I'm talking to the dentist there and I say, when was the last time you went to lunch with any of the other six dentists in the same exact building? And they almost every time say, I've never done that ever. And I'm like, oh, and Dentaltown was such a success because they're more natural to talk to you online uh, because you're far away, but the dentist next door in their building, they see as, well, maybe this is my competitor and and this, and it's just silly. And, And when I find a dentist who's happy, healthy, and just doing everything right, they always have lots of friends in their same city and I, I, I can't emphasize enough how many times if you just walk into the dental office and say, hey, let's go to lunch and just press the flesh. You're not competitors. The only thing we're competing against is these people buying iPhones and computers and trips to Germany, uh, not the dentist across the street. So in, in all your implant training, um, you um, what in America – 95% of the general dentists have never placed one implant in their life. When you go to other countries, three out of four dentists have placed implants in South Korea or Germany. What percent of the dentists in Romania would you say have placed a dental implant in the last one year? I think 60 or 70 percent. 
So, so you're so a big part of my audience is uh, the, the United States. Um, what would you tell a dentist listening to you right now for an hour who's never placed an implant? What What would you tell that dentist? Uh, he should not uh, be um, attracted by the um, concept of surgery before he understands the real benefit of a dental implant and how to integrate a dental implant inside the mouth. Because we see nice pictures, we see nice results, we see nice books, because the books are meant to be attractive, uh, we get a chapter with complications, but it's the last one, generally. <laughs> um, it's the last one. I, I know a book which, uh, which uh, I don't remember exactly the um, title, but is entitled uh, entire about uh, complications. But I think it's the only book. Um, they have to be aware. We have to be aware that we are placing a dental implant that doesn't belong to the mouth, and besides the benefit, the financial benefits, and maybe some um, trust gaining uh, for, from our colleagues and from our patients, we should see 10 years ahead what, what is going to happen with this dental implant. Because it's easy to drill a hole, uh, insert an implant, place a crown, the um, dental technician is uh, maybe a great technician, he will uh, get us out of trouble, but in general we have to be aware that 10 years ahead uh, something is going to happen. It's like a microwave uh, machine that you are uh, turning. You are tu turning the, the time timer, and it's going to it's going to close one day. Something is going to happen. So let's start getting into specifics. What do you think a dentist? Okay, so let let's talk to a dentist who's never placed an implant. What would you recommend for their training? I mean, do you think this is something they can learn on a weekend course? How how would you recommend someone go from I've never placed a dental implant to I want to start placing a dental implant? I I want to talk about myself for this question because I was so, so into dental implants, so uh, into um, surgery, oral surgery, I was, I was loving this, uh, this uh, area, and I, I, I love this area right now, but I love it be because different reasons appeared. But at the first, um, the, 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 some blood, some um, adrenaline rush, some um, um, something um, that uh, I, I was... I was uh, thinking of myself that I'm above the others because I place uh, implants, I make a cut, I suture, I do something uh, that no, not everyone does, uh, gave me this uh, rush of uh, dental implants, if I can say it like that. But after a while, I, I, I started to see, fortunately, not, uh, not many of my cases, but I, I started to see dentistry and implant dentistry different. So for, for a beginner uh, in implant dentistry, an implant should be placed only after proper training and only after, uh, after mastering different um, techniques on um, hands-on, on, hands -on, on um, um, simple cases, really simple cases, like uh, like um, a simple implant between two teeth with uh, bone uh, height and width enough, uh, so no problems can uh, can uh, come from that uh, that surgery. If we try to be smart and if we try to make a sinus lift because we saw it on uh, YouTube or uh, on a webinar or on a seminar or on a weekend uh, training, I think a lot of problems can appear. Um, and uh, if we are not able to manage the problems, the potential problems, we, we are going to be in trouble. The patient is going to uh, get infected or um, a higher risk for um, different uh, uh, local or general um, complications. And um, I think this is the start. A simple dental implant placed where the bone is under uh, surveillance from an uh, uh, expert or from a um, um, dentist that um, have more experience, that, that should be a start. But never try complicate 
complicated uh, subjects. And so it's a it's a it's a big uh, it's a big subject. It's it's a um, sensitive subject because in uh, in Europe it's a it's a bit a bit different than in America. We are not get, sorry, we are not get uh, um, sued uh, as easy as in America. Yeah, Amer- America, uh, it's sad because we actually have um, over 1 million attorneys, but only 900,000 physicians and 150,000 dentists. I mean, any country that has more lawyers than doctors has got their priorities uh, mixed up. But you're actually teaching live implant training in your office for dentists inside and outside of Romania, correct? Yes, we are, at, uh, we are beginners in this area. We try to um, attract some clinicians, some clinicians that don't have uh, a lot of, um, um, how do you say it, uh, that they have some time to spend and uh, are not um, confusing our work with uh, something that we are um, um, stand for. We, we are trying. We are trying to attract. A few dentists that are really passionate about about uh, microsurgery, about surgery in general, about dentistry, and and so let's uh, so you also um, use a microscope. Do you use microscope during endodontics root canals, or are you using microscopes during implant surgery? I try to use the microscope for all my surgery. Um, it's, it's a bit uh, difficult because sometimes I don't, I don't have uh, straight access. I have to look in the mirror. Maybe dental implants in the posterior area are not a great idea to be placed with a dental microscope. But I can do certain parts of the surgery with the dental microscope. And I can check my flap. I can um, erase uh, my, my flap. Uh, erase, not erase. I can raise my flap. I can close the flap. I can make a sinus lift with it. I can do a lot of things. And in general dentistry also. We use it for 99% of of our dentistry. Seeing is amazing. A dentist that uses the naked eye does not know what they're missing compared to, you know, my first journey was two and a half loops and it's 3.8 loops. Um, what I like the most about the, the CAD CAM dentistry is seeing your prep 40 times larger. Which microscope did you buy? Which one did you go with? I have a Labomed from the U.S. What's it called? Labomed. Labomed. You, can you spell it? L-A-B-O-M-E-D. Huh, Labomed. Yes, Labomed. Huh, okay. And, and how do you like that one? I like it. Uh, it can be uh, um, it, it can be improved. I don't get a lot of lightning, but because uh, lightning in the um, in the camera, but that's my fault. Uh, the optics are great. It's a it's a it's a good uh, it's a good deal for the money. And it's what magnification are you using um, your microscope at? Ten x, fifteen x, how? Six x, six x for the surgery. Ten uh, x for. Uh, Fillings and root canals. I don't do a lot of root canals. My colleagues are doing it, but when I do when I do exploring and cleaning, I do 10x, 16x only for checking, 24x almost never because even if the wind is blowing, I'm gonna get some confusion. What, what do you use the 16x for? For checking, I, I check my um, my cementation. I check my um, sinus with uh, small mirrors. I check um, after an extraction, I check the socket. I check my sutures, 10x, uh, 16x. Okay, and so going back to implants, um, there's it's very confusing for dentists because there were over 275 dental implant companies last year at the Cologne meeting in Germany how, how would you help a dentist pick a system when there's so many systems out there? Which system did you go with? I have a lot of systems. Toys and their toys. <laughs> yes, I, I tried different strategies. I tried uh, at that time, at the beginning, I tried uh, the internal hacks with uh, bone level. 
After that, I try, I've tried the cone with uh, more taper. I tried um, the company Megagen, you know, the Megagen company. I've tried different different types of implants. Um, implant Direct, which is uh, it's a great implant. I tried to place it at the bone level. I've tried to place it under the bone. I have some uh, external hex prosthetic parts from external for external hex. I never placed an external hex implant, but I have a few crowns made uh, on uh, external hex platform, which in uh, some ways are great uh, are great implants if we can manage the soft tissue around. But it's a it's a really it's a really really hard task to choose an implant, as you said, because the companies are spending more on advertising and more on um, promoting few extra benefits or few extra um, how do you say it few extra um, um, features or benefits features exactly. Uh, they are spending more on this than on uh, proper training for the dentist. So I will always like a company that brings me experienced dentists that have placed uh, thousands or hundreds of implants from their uh, produce, production. And uh, those guys are telling me what to do here, what to do here, not to do in that case. I like I like this strategy more than only advertising the best uh, platform or the best uh, bone to implant contact. That those are just marketing stuff. So, so, it's, easy, so it's, it's easy it's easy to uh, perform uh, with any dental implant as long as we accept some limitations from the from that uh, system. So are you talking about you, you're, you're using an implant system that has someone locally in um, Romania to help you with questions? Or are you talking about the support is online? Yes, I, have, I have a lot of, I have a lot of uh, people that I can ask. In, uh, in your city, Arad, Arad, Romania? To be honest, no, not, not in Arad because um, – I don't know. I don't know. I'm not in contact with a lot of people in Arad. I'm too busy in my office, so I don't get out uh, very often. But uh, I know people that I'm contacting uh, via internet or by phone from Tim, from Timisoara, from Bucharest, from uh, outside the country. And uh, if I have a question, if I have a tough situation, I will most certainly ask them to, to guide me. And it's a better it's a better idea than do it by myself. So what well, so what system are you with now? I have a, a system uh, implant direct. Implant direct, which is online. Yes. So yes. so that's what you may, mostly use implant direct. Yes, I use it. I use it because I have two two types of implants. I have a bone level and I have a, a submerged. Okay. Implant. Okay, and, and ex please explain that for our viewers. I, my, my job is to try to ask questions. I'm trying to guess what people – so there, there's some guy driving to work, and he's saying, what's the difference between a bone-level implant and a submerged implant? Can you talk about that? It's a, it's a, it's a large debate on what, uh, what type of implants should we use if we use it in the lateral part of the mouth, if we use it in the lower jaw, if you use it, uh, if you use it in the uh, upper jaw, if you use it – for aesthetic reasons, if you use it for an over uh, over um, over denture, for example, if I use it for lateral part of the mouth, I will most certainly use a bone level implant. It's not ideal. Um, some people are saying that supra gingival or gingival level implants are the best because we don't get uh, too much uh, connection, disconnect, uh, con connect, uh, connect, disconnect uh, the, the abutment from the implant, so we are not gonna, gonna lose attachment. Um, but I use a bone level implant. That means that I will get some um, bone retraction after uh, uncovering of the implant. If I manage to, to stabilize the tissue, the soft tissue, 
I will get away with it, even if I lose one or two millimeters of bone, which is not great, but these are, these are the options that we have uh, for now. If I want to use uh, an implant for um, a sinus, for example, or for a soft bone, I want to use a more tapered implant, for example. And I like to use it, um, submerge it one millimeter, one millimeter under the bone, because I want uh, some bone jumping over the, the margin of the implant. Of course, we need a proper prosthetic part for that uh, type of implant, which uh, is uh, a platform switching or a cone. Um, that cone that allows me to, to get some tissue over the, the margin of the implant. If I want to use um, an anterior reconstruction, I will most uh, certainly have to use an implant that has that have uh, proper prosthetic parts like zirconia, like um, how do you say for a uh, noble have uh, procera, procera abutments. I don't use noble because in my country and in my city especially, it's not that easy to place uh, such an exclusive implant. But we have uh, this option for um, cone, cone, uh, cone uh, connection, and it works great for the aesthetic uh, part of the mouth. Okay. But the implant, but the implant, sorry, but the implant is not the only issue. What we do with the tissue around the implant is important. Okay, before you go into the tissue and come back to that, but um, originally you said you you um, share your experiences of uh, you said you. You used to use an internal hacks and then use the external hacks. De describe your lessons you've learned and what's the difference between internal hacks, external hacks, and your takeaway lessons of that. And then also talk about the, uh, the the Morris taper. Explain what that is and what your experiences with with that. That uh, that taper that taper connection allows me to have a, be a better fit of the abutment inside the implant, and I'm not going to have a micro leakage because the cone is uh, three or four degrees, I think, um, and um, I will get uh, the best fit between those parts, between the implant and the abutment. After that, uh, after that benefit, uh, the benefit of uh, bone jumping and tissue jumping, I will get a tissue growing between the, the edge, the marginal part of the implant, and the, um, the, most, the Morse uh, abutment. I will get some tissue there for free, as the uh, uh, teacher said. I get some, some, some tissue for free there. So are you, are you using a Morse taper now? Yes, I use, I use, it's not really Morse, it's like a cone. I have to, I have to check with the exactly the degree of the of the cone, but it's a cone which is really really it's better than uh, uh, standard uh, standard internal hex connection. It's a cone inside the implant. I have to check the degree, but uh, but it's stable and I don't get micro leakage as far as I uh, observed until now. And then um, the, explain for a listener who might not be clear about the difference between an internal hex and an external hex and what you like about the differences between an internal hex and an external hex. Your takeaway lessons from that. We have so, so little benefits for the external hex. Uh, the external hex uh, is an old timer, as I can say, but... I saw some some tissue some tissue stability because the connection it's a bit above the bone level, so I, I don't get too much inflammation if I remove the um, the prosthetic part. The external hex have um, um, the benefit of uh, checking the connection. The, um, um, the, the um, connection between between the abutment. Yes, my English. I told you my English is not great. Your English is amazing. If, 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 a, if a dentist can't understand you, I'd like to hear the Romanian. I have the English is great, but the words are not really. I think you're doing fantastic. I think you're doing amazing. Um, that the external the external hex 
gave me the benefit of controlling what's inside the implant much easier than with the internal apps. If I don't, uh, if I'm contaminating it for accident, in an accident, uh, if I contaminate it, it will be harder to clean the inside part of that uh, of that implant. But the the, the implants are are not uh, used today because they have um, a more un unstable connection because the external X is about half a millimeter or maybe a millimeter. So the connection is uh, it's lost easily uh, during the forces, the, the occlusal forces. I also I also think that an internal hex um, gave me the possibility of better fit than the external hex. I don't know. I I, I didn't study that subject uh, too much because I never use it. Only I only use it three times for the prosthetic part. I saw I saw tissue stability, but I didn't saw bone around that uh, area. The bone was all, also uh, two, one or two one or two millimeters uh, down uh, down uh, under the connection. So so then you want to talk about tissue? What you're saying is is more important. What 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 are, what are your thoughts on the tissue around the implant? If I want a stable bone around the implant, I have to get some stable gingival level and some stable gingival um, uh, consistent, um, how do you say it? Um, I have to get a stable and thick gingival around the implant. If I cannot manage that, my implant is going to be lost in a few years because I will get some pocket and... Uh, Maybe the pre-implant it is will um, develop in years, and I will lose my implant much, much uh, earlier than uh, with the proper soft tissue around it. So, so what? I'm trying to get a lot of soft tissue around the implant, a lot of bone around the implant, and soft tissue around. So do you uh, so talk about when do you ever just punch a hole through the tissue versus laying a flap? I'm gonna lay a micro flap. I'm not gonna lay a flap if I cannot, if I I don't have to, because the flap around the implant after placing the implant, uh, I don't want to disturb the tissue that is around it. But punching the hole is gonna destroy some uh, keratinized tissue that uh, I maybe need it, need for for a proper uh, architecture around it. So I I will always make a cut. A small cut and try to manage the tissue um, versus uh, punching the hole. It's much. It's a higher. It's a higher demanding skill, but uh, it's not uh, like uh, you're doing brain surgery. So describe a micro flap surgery versus a traditional full flap surgery. How are you actually first doing all, it? First of all, we need magnification, not. Not uh, mi a microscope, but we need uh, at least dental loops with a certain magnification, at least uh, 4x, for example, because I want to see my 6-0, my 7-0, otherwise I I'm not going to manage it. Uh, if you are trying to suture with 7-0 with your naked eyes, you will see that it's hard to suture with it. And... Um, I'm trying to use, and we are trying to use for a micro concept, we are trying to use micro blades and micro instruments. I know it's a general term, micro, but uh, we try to stay minimally invasive in that area so we don't disturb the biology too much. That's the micro concept. Other colleagues uh, are arguing because we are not doing not anything micro. We are not doing micro, but... We are trying to stay as small as uh, possible, even with our uh, healing gaps, even with our uh, suture material, even uh, with uh, our burrs today. And what, what, what do you think are the main reasons, the, the top reasons that an implant fails? Do you think it's periamplantitis? Do you think it's occlusion? What, why, why do, when you, first of all, what do you think your success rate is with implants and, or, or in, um, your success rate of implants, but when implants fail, what, why do you think they do get into trouble? I only I only lose 
influence when uh, I try different things other that I'm used to do. If I'm trying to um, immediate loading an implant uh, that is not uh, proper, uh, that doesn't have proper to torque, um, I will get, I will maybe get um, a loose implant and I will, I will have to, to remove it and uh, place another one. But my success rate or my failure rate is low because I'm always trying to um, be patient. I don't like patients that are uh, in a rush, like patients that uh, come from abroad and uh, they want everything in three weeks. <laughs> I don't do that. I don't do that. I do implants in three weeks, but I do submerged implants in three weeks. I don't do uh, provisionals if I'm not uh, uh, sure that my implants are stable, if I'm not going to use a proper guide, um, guided implant surgery, I'm not going to use um, a provisionals um, at the first uh, stage of uh, the surgery because it's much safer. Of course, this, uh, this is a limitation maybe, but uh, I'm, I, uh, I'm, I'm dealing with, with, with this um, great. I don't have complaints. People, I, I, um, I prefer to make my patients wait for three or four months, even, uh, even if uh, my patients are putting constant pressure on me. But I think my success rates are um, um, based on that, uh, on that uh, patients. And do you, do you uh, use CBCT, three-dimensional radiography, yes, for, for all it's, your implants? I use it for 90% of my implants because uh, I get uh, surprises from time to time. A lingual um, concavity that uh, I was not aware of it. Now, a bone, um, a, a large amount of bone. If I'm doing um, only a, a standard radiograph, like panoramic radiograph, I will see a lot of bone. If I'm checking it orally, I will see a lot of bone, and on the CBCT, I will see a, a big concavity in the lingual part. So that there, I will be in trouble if I'm not going to use uh, proper proper guidance. So, which CBCT did you go with? There's so many on the market. I have Galileo's uh, a company that provides me with Galileo's, um, a company that provides me with Kodak. Kodak, and what was the yes. other one, Iteros? No, Galileos. Oh, Galileos. Yes. Galileos from uh, Sorona, and the other yes, one Sirona. was uh, Kodak. Yes. And I don't know. I don't know the. I don't know the machine. I don't have it in my office. I have it uh, in. A, in a... And and does it matter to you if they come back to your office and this um, from the radiological center and they come back with a CBCT from Galileo, Sorona, or Kodak CareStream? Does it, does it matter to you, or or can you? It, ma it matters. It matters if I'm if, if I'm trying to make um, a specific measure, and I'm not um, I'm not used to to that software. But in general, I use um, both or um, all, all the all the software are intuitive uh, today, and uh, it's easy it's easy to work with uh, with uh, CBCT. And what, okay, so you use a, a CBCT on 90% of your implants. What percent of your implants do you use a surgical guide? I have a low percentage of surgical guide because um, in, my, my CP, in, my CP, in my CP, they didn't develop, develop uh, this uh, strategy. The, the, the companies are, are not providing me with uh, uh, this logistic. So I have to ask um, from uh, other cities to provide me with uh, with measures and with um, uh, the guidance. And well, my patients have to uh, make some travel to take uh, some um, some um, I don't know how do you say it in impressions. English. Yes, yes, and it's a bit hard. But I never had um, I never had problems, big problems. But this is not an advice. I should use more proper guidance for uh, for my implants. But to be fair, I think 
80% of the 80% of the dentists are in, are placing implants without guide without guided surgery. And, and is that 80% in Romania or 80%? I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a number. It's a number. It's a number. But uh, I see that it's not a lot of publicity made for from uh, our companies uh, in that direction. So I can see that uh, only a few people are making uh, proper uh, guidance. It sounds like a, it, it sounds like it. it sounds like a great uh, business um, advice it is. for and someone. It's yeah, so it's somebody good. listening to this uh, podcast uh, should take a uh, surgical guide company and set it up in uh, Bucharest, and they'd probably have a flourishing business. It's, develop, it's a developing business. I, I get uh, an offer from Megagen, for example. They have this R2Gate system, which is, which is a great system. Um, they are developing uh, it in Bucharest, uh, in the capital city. And uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, in um, I'm in uh, discussions with uh, this company because I'm gonna try uh, their uh, their guided surgery uh, machine. They have so, uh, also so these uh, apartments. Uh, so you're gonna try the new Megagen guided surgery um, technique? Yes, I think it's great because they also do some uh, individualized uh, apartments. With um, provisionals, so I can do one uh, one abutment one time uh, technique. Otherwise, it's hard because you don't know where to place the margin of the abutment. They do this. It it has certain limitations because you have to raise a minimal invasive flap. If you do a, a large flap with uh, bone grafting and uh, soft tissue grafting they are never going to be able to provide you with a one-time abutment uh, strategy. It's not, it's, it's not possible. You have to remove that abutment to place the correct uh, gingival line for the final prosthesis. So it's, it's, a, it's promising. It's a promising um, um, technique to use this r 2 gate system. I think... Uh, Dr. Roberto Rossi is using it a lot, and uh, he has uh, a lot of great success with uh, with this type of uh, treatment. Dr. And, Bill Rossi? Uh, in, in, Bill, yes, Dr. Dr. Rossi. Yes. In, in Italy? Yes, in Italy. I like his work. He's doing a great job. And uh, I was talking with him about this strategy, and uh, he told me that uh, that uh, they do they do a great job, those guys from Novogen. But in general, I use... Uh, guided surgery, guided uh, placement based on my wax up and my mock-ups. I'm trying to use a certain amount of guidance from my mock-up, wax up, mock-up uh, system. And are you, on your implants with the final restoration, are you cementing or screwing them down? I, I was cementing everything until... One day, I did, around the final prosthetic parts, uh, I did some soft tissue augmentation, and under microscope, I saw a lot of cement, even if uh, I was cementing it with um, retraction cord and under magnification. I saw a lot of cement. It was cemented, I think, two months before the surgery, and I saw some, some, um, a lot of cement under it, and um, from that time I never did uh, cemented the restorations uh, besides um, on uh, zirconia abutments. Uh, there I can do a lot of, uh, a better checking, but uh, I do a lot of uh, screw retained uh, restorations from that time. So, what do you, what are your thoughts on um, preventing and controlling periimplantitis? First of all, I do this type of uh, restorations. I do retain restorations. I do six months or four months uh, screening after pla uh, implant placement and after uh, seeking the provisionals and after seeking the final restorations. We do a lot of, uh, we have a call center that uh, uh, have um, um, control of the, over the patients. And uh, we are trying to 
uh, tell our patients what to do at home because we have a certain control in the office, but after the patient leaves, is not uh, in our hands. The hygiene is not in our hands anymore. So if we see that uh, the patient doesn't clean the area correctly, we are trying to perform uh, some um, maintenance and some um, guidance for them in order to to perfect their, their hygiene protocol. Uh, I have a specialist uh, in, in uh, oral hygiene that is doing the proper cleaning and proper training for the patients. Do you find more periimplantitis with people who lost their teeth from gum disease as opposed to people who lost their teeth from a cavity dental decay? The study shows that it's a difference because the gingival biotype uh, and the gingival um, health play a huge role. But I didn't pay attention exactly at that, uh, at that uh, detail because I'm trying to make my patients to clean prop- in a proper way. I'm trying to stop the peri- periodontis, uh, this, the, the periodontal disease prior placing implants. So if, I'm, if I have trouble with a patient that uh, is not cleaning right or he doesn't respond uh, to our medication, I'm not gonna pay, play the. Uh, I'm not gonna place the implant uh, until I'm um, sure that uh, he can manage the hygiene around it. So I have to stop the, the periodontal disease, uh, have almost zero inflammation or zero inflammation, and only after that I will I will do I will do the implant uh, treatment. So I didn't pay um, I didn't pay attention to, uh, at that detail to make that difference. Yeah. But the studies show that uh, that it, it is a difference, a big one. Yeah, the, I think the biggest problem about implants is, is that the people who lost, who need the implants the most, had the least amount of home care. I mean, there, there's a reason. I mean, you and I aren't missing any teeth, and the people, you know, in my practice that are missing most of the teeth, there's reasons they're missing a lot of teeth. They're not good with brushing and flossing. They're not good with coming in every six months for cleaning. So uh, that, that's a deal. I want you to switch subjects. Um, I've only got you 10 more minutes. Um, so what, what do you want to uh, talk about as far as sinus lifts? What, what are your thoughts on sinus lifts? I'm trying to avoid it, but uh, I have a lot, a lot of patients that have two or three millimeters of bone in that area. So most of the time uh, when I'm placing an implant and I do an external sinus lift, I'm asked uh, even you know, on, uh, on um, prestigious forums like uh, yours or, uh, or Dental XP or, or when I place my, uh, my uh, case presentations, uh, I'm always asked um, about uh, the other specialists, why, why didn't I perform the internal sinus lift procedure? Because I'm not sure that it will work. If I break the, um, if I uh, perforate the membrane, I will be in a bigger problem than if I do um, um, a micro open uh, in the bone and, and uh, raise that uh, that uh, Schneiderian membrane. So I do external sinus sinus because I have a lot of patients with almost zero bone there. So I, I have to be sure. A lot of people do internal sinus lift with on if, if they have two or three millimeters of bone, they do internal sinus lift. I'm I'm not sure if that works. Uh, in every case, so I do external. And and, and my job is to uh, ask the questions that someone's out there, you know, while they're listening. Explain the difference between an internal and an external sinus lift for someone who doesn't understand what that means. The external sinus lift is the procedure where we place a small window in the lateral part of the, the maxilla uh, in order to gain access to the Schneiderian membrane, which is uh, in the, uh, inside the sinus. And we are trying to elevate it with um, proper tools, with uh, curettes, in order to make room for some bone to grow uh, inside the sinus. We place um, artificial bone, like bovine, inside it. Some people use only PRF or only PRGF inside the sinus 
but we are trying to get um, some bone, some stable substitute or bone substitute, which are uh, which is inserted through that uh, window. In the internal sinus lift procedure, we do um, the, the elevation of the membrane, or the Schneiderian membrane, through the hole for the implant placement. If we drill the hole for the implant and we try to elevate the membrane through that small hole. It works, but it works when we have um, a clean sinus floor without um, a septum, without um, a rough surface, which we can all often see on the CPCT. Uh, it works, but I'm not sure that I want to try it um, in... Um, Sinus when we when we uh, try to insert two implants for example in that sinus I don't want to um, elevate the membrane through the hole to the implant hole it's too risky so external sinus lift is uh, through the window of uh, that we we make in the lateral part of the maxilla and the internal sinus lift is through the implant hole. Now, when I was uh, little, uh, when I got out of school in 87, the, the, the big name on the external sinus lift was Dr. Tatum. Have you ever heard of his name? He was a dentist here in Florida that was teaching everybody how to do that. I'm not sure. Yeah, and, and he actually, I think he moved, he moved to Europe. Um, back to bone grafting. Um, explain, you use a lot of terms, and I'm thinking some listeners are missing that. Explain the difference between bovine and what did you say, PRF, PRGF? Bovine bone is a bone strip substitute, uh, which is made from uh, bovine bone. Um, it's like it's the, this is a small particles of bone that are uh, deantigenized and uh, deprotein. Pro, how do you say? Deproteinized. So um, it doesn't get reaction from the from the host, from the uh, body, the human body. We are inserting this um, type of bone in order to gain access, uh, to gain a, a volume uh, for the human bone to grow from from uh, under underneath. Uh, in other words, we are placing this um, particulated bone in a fa in a, in a manner that we get some space manage uh, maintenance. Uh, so how do you say it? Uh, to to grow bone from under? Uh, I don't know how to explain it in in English. Um, and just just for the audience, bovine uh, means cow. Yeah, bo cow. Yes, cattle. It's buffalo. bovine mineralized bone made from bovine bone, which is uh, which is uh, particulated and placed over the human bone um, in order to uh, get some vo bone volume later on. And during then, the, after the healing period. And then the other two types of bone you said, PRF and PRGF? Or? PRF, it's, uh, it's a blood clot made, uh, um, separated, uh, the, the, fibra, the fibrin clot, which is separated from uh, the patient blood. We are centrifuge it uh, at a certain speed, and uh, we are separating the fibrin in order to use it as a... Um, a healing accelerator. The PRGF is the same product, but it's not available uh, in uh, in Europe. The, I don't know exactly the protocol. I've heard it. Uh, and what per, what America. what percent of your bone grafts are you drawing the patient's blood and centrifuging and getting the? Uh, I think I, I think ninety nine percent of of the time. Ninety nine or ninety? Yes. I think ninety nine. Today I did today I did a bone graft without it, but I think this is the one percent. And 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 do you think that increases your success rate with the uh, bone grafting significantly? I mean, yes. And what yes. In, in your career, what was your success rate with bone grafting before you started drawing blood um, versus now your bone grafting with drawing the patient's blood and doing this technique? I didn't draw numbers, but I'm sure that if I bring fibrin, fibrin um, that is not going to get there through the capillarity, I will get a better healing, of course. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't check uh, to see 
at that time how good it heals because the patient healed properly. But I see today that uh, in two weeks I get a better healing that was I was get, getting at, uh, at that time without using the PR. So, so you're you're mostly noticing a faster healing time by drawing a blood. Faster soft tissue healing, not not bone healing time. I don't know the bone. The bone is under the tissue, so under the soft tissue. But I see a better soft tissue healing, and that's good for me because the faster the soft tissue heals, the better the bone graft uh, will uh, will uh, react. And we we um we have listeners to this podcast in 206 countries. If a dentist is listening to you right now and wants to go to go to Romania for uh to to learn from you, how how would they find information about you? Uh, they can find information. Uh, we are developing a new website. I don't have a, a proper website right now because we are developing it. But uh, they can uh, they can contact us uh, via um, via um, uh, Facebook or via um, um, Google. They can Google us, and uh, they will find a lot of information about our clinic and about uh, my name. They can Google my name. Um, I I don't I didn't I didn't pay uh, attention to um, promoting us um, too much because. We, we, we tried to make our clinic a bit um, a cozy place, not crowded, not um, overwhelmed. So we are trying to make our, our reputation based on, on uh, our results. That's why we didn't make a lot, of, uh, a lot of publicity. But the website is developing and it will get, uh, it will have um, a proper section for uh, training. But uh, we are at the beginning uh, in that area. We are, I'm not going to say too much about it. I uh, I would want to go just because I would love to see Romania. That is I my, my goal, one of my goals before I die, I want to see every country on earth. I've seen 50, and I want to see them all. And I have heard that Romania is just beautiful. It's beautiful, and you have a lot of uh, landscapes. You have a lot of opportunities to visit. Um, but uh, you have to be prepared to travel a lot because uh, you have uh, you have um, all type of uh, roads. Uh, the Romanian roads are not like the American roads, but I think this is the this is the beauty of it because you will get uh, extra um, um, extra fun, extra adrenaline. Uh, you should come, and you are most welcome, and uh, uh, you will you will be amazed. How great and how um, kind people are here! Oh, I I imagine. Um, it's funny when I go to Cologne and you buy a train pass, they always think you're a German and they try to put you in a high speed train that goes 100 miles an hour, and mm-hmm. you have to stop them and say, "No, I'm a tourist. I want the old rickety train that's following the river that's real slow with all the views." And they always say, no, 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 you, you have a first-class ticket. You, you can go to the high speed. It's like, I don't want the high speed. I want the uh, slowest speed. And I have to make one more point on, on roads. I, um, you know who has the best roads in the world? It's not the United States, and it's not Germany's Autobahns. You know who it is? No. It's Sydney, Australia, and I'll tell you why. When they started, they, they had a subway system. And then they realized, you know, so they had all the technology for building uh, subways underground. And then when their streets got all congested, like in in Phoenix, you know, like right now in my neighborhood, they're tearing down a hundred homes to to widen a freeway. A hundred homes. In Sydney, Australia, since they had the technology to build subways, they just started building a whole bunch of tunnels underneath Sydney. So in Sydney, you can just drop down in a tunnel, shoot clear across town, and pop up on the other side. I mean, it is so cool how they've uh, mastered tunneling. Uh, but um, we are out of time. It is one hour. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm a big fan of yours. I think you're uh, an amazing person, and it's so exciting that the internet and podcasting and dental town allows us to uh, – I feel like I just went to lunch with you, and we're uh, 10,000 miles apart. So – um, thank you for staying up with me tonight, and uh, I know you had a long day of surgery, and it's just an honor and a privilege. 
Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you for uh, your time and thank you for understanding that uh, with uh, uh, my, in my bad English, uh, you, 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 you had uh, a lot of patience and uh, you, you knew how to ask uh, the proper questions in order to not make me uh, look uh, like a dentist who doesn't know English at all. Thank you well, very much. I'll tell you, my favorite joke is, what do you call someone who speaks two languages? Bilingual. What do you call someone who only speaks one language? An American. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for being bilingual so that you could talk to me since I'm not smart enough to be able to talk to you in Romanian. Thank you very much. All right. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.